Welcome, welcome, welcome to D4, D&D Deep Dive. How's it going, everybody? This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a character, but to explore one possible way of creating a character in the hopes of making something that is both really fun, but also really powerful to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D, almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build a particular character that you're thinking about building, then welcome home. This is where you belong. It is, and I'm so glad you're here. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. Really quick, before we jump in, if you'd be interested in getting a little cheat sheet to help you recreate this character without having to go back and rewatch the video or take notes, or if you're just looking for a way to support the channel because you like the content, I would love it if you would consider joining as a member. There's a little button down there that you can click that says join. For $2 a month, you can get access to the library that I have of write-ups for every single episode that I do, every single character build, so that you can get a step-by-step -step guide on recreating it. And again, also, it's just a nice way to support the channel. Huge shout out to my channel members. Thank you guys so much, love you. And for everybody else, Thank you so much for being here, and I love you too. Just watching and subscribing and liking and commenting are also fantastic ways to support the channel. You don't have to give me money. If you really don't want to, it's okay. I appreciate you being here, and thanks for the consideration. So, long-time viewers of this channel know that I really love to take advantage of spells in my character builds that let you, like, double dip on damage. Like with the Nature Cleric, for example, or the Catch-22, which might have been the first one that I ever did after this fashion. What I mean is spells that let you get damage more than once per round. For the uninitiated, there are a few spells in the game that tell us that an enemy will take damage from the spell both when they start their turn within the area of effect of the spell and if they are moved into the area of effect of the spell when it's not their turn. And if you doubt whether this actually works or not, check out the Sage Advice Compendium and search for Moonbeam and you'll find where it talks about it. In a nutshell, with spells like Moonbeam or Spirit Guardians, a creature can take damage from these spells once on a turn. So if you can find a way to move them into the area when it's not their turn, with forced movement that is, then you can potentially double dip, as it were. But I mean, really, in theory, if everyone in your party took the opportunity to pull an enemy out of, say, Moonbeam on their turn and move the enemy back into the Moonbeam on their same turn, everyone in your party could theoretically cause the enemy to take Moonbeam damage on their turn, right? Because it happens once on a turn, not in a round, or on your turn only, or on their turn only, etc. With that being said, Here's my question. How many times would it be possible for a single character working by themselves without help from their allies to do damage to an enemy with a spell like this in a single round? Could you do it more than twice? Once on your turn, once on theirs. Could you, in fact, triple dip? The answer, I think, is yes, you can. What if I told you that you could even do this to multiple enemies over a single round? What if I also told you that you could exert some incredibly strong control on the battlefield while simultaneously doing sustainable, consistent damage to multiple enemies with a single spell over an entire round. I know, I know, you would be like, yeah, I already know how to do that. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to them. Hey, other person, what's up? Does this sound super exciting? Because I am super excited to tell you about it. So yes, this means that for the second week in a row, actually, I'm doing a sustained damage build that can do damage to two enemies per round. But with the huge added benefit for this character of simultaneously exerting some really fantastic control on those enemies that you're doing damage to, because FYI, we're going to be grappling here. Oh, and also, we're going to be doing all of this as a mostly bard character. Yep, a bard grappler. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's talk about episode 116, the triple dip, the big burly bard. Ooh, the meat grinder. Eh, let's just keep it simple. 
episode 116, The Bardic Brawler. Huge thanks, as always, to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he created for this character concept that I sent him. He does this for every build that I create every single week, and without fail, I love what he comes up with. He's a fantastic artist. If you would be interested in following him to check out the other stuff that he's done, or even trying to commission him to create some art for you or your party, I will, as always, put links in the video description on how to do so. Thanks, Randall. And also, really quick, you guys, don't skip. I need to tell you about the sponsor for this week, because I am so excited about them. They have totally won my heart. It's a company called Tabletop Candle Company, and they make the most delicious smelling candles in the entire world, all inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. I cannot say enough about how much I love this company. They sent me a huge box of their products, and they have all kinds of really cool, great smelling stuff. They have little baby candles, like this Warlock one. Oh yeah. I'd totally sell my soul for that scent. Also, little wax melters, like this fighter scent. Mmm, smells like cinnamon and leadership. Oh, and also, best thing ever, little dice wax melters. I could die. <laughs> Get it? This is Barbarian, and I just want to play with these and never melt them so I can actually just smell them all the time. Mmm, smell that tribal earthiness. And, special surprise, I have asked my lovely wife, Arianne, to join me very briefly here as I ask her to take a first sniff of my favorite scents. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Rogue is one of my favorites. <sighs> Coconut milk, bergamot, cedarwood, and musk. It's very earthy and foresty. It's like being enveloped in the warm dark. Cleric. Peonies, lavender, citrus, sandalwood. Mmm. It's like incense burning in a temple. Hmm. That's nice and fresh. Mm hmm My favorite class, the monk. And might be my favorite scent too. Sage, orange blossom, oak moss, and amber. I would seriously drink that mm. if I could, and all of my chakras would be aligned as a result. It's very grounding. Mm hmm, mm -hmm. Ranger. Um, this is their big candle, and like these little wax dice, like that melt inside the candle, right? And it's just pure, unadulterated forest mm -hmm. right there. That's mm -hmm. your Christmas candle, right? Yeah. It's like pine, pine and eucalyptus. And last but not least, this one's actually probably my favorite, the Druid. That is a flowery glade in spring. Mm -hmm. Honeysuckle, jasmine, violet. Okay. Energetic and mm. fresh. Anyway, you guys, seriously, you've got to check out Tabletop Candle Company. This is absolutely going to add to the ambiance of your next D&D game, or to the ambiance while you soak in the tub dreaming of your next D&D character that you're going to build, which is maybe what I'll be doing later. <laughs> Go to tabletopcandlecompany.com. I'll put the link in the video description, of course. I promise you guys, order from them. You will not be disappointed. I mean, seriously, like, don't tell them this, but I kind of feel bad for charging them money for this sponsorship. Like, I, I probably would have done it just for product. They smell really good. They do. So help them get their money back that they gave me and go make an order or two. You'd make great gifts. Thanks, Tabletop Candle Company. Thank you, Ariane. Well, let's jump into the build. Okay, at level one, for our starting class, we're gonna start fighter. Since I've indicated that we're going to be grappling, I'm sure many of you probably can guess why I'm starting fighter. For everyone else, just know that we've got very good reasons for doing so, and most of them we'll get to shortly. But I also really like starting fighter one because we get heavy armor proficiency and shield proficiency that we wouldn't otherwise get as a bard, as well as, importantly, constitution saving throw proficiency. Since, yes, we are going to be concentrating on a spell through most of our character's career. As for our race, I actually have a few that I would consider here. I almost went orc, because they can dash as a bonus action, proficiency bonus times per day, and that would definitely come in handy for this character sometimes, as movement is going to be key for us. Gif, or Jif, would be good if you didn't want to start fighter and just wanted to go straight bard for this build, since, most importantly, they get advantage on strength checks and saves which would mean grapple checks, right? That is going to be a little bit redundant for us, though. So I decided against the hippo. 
Of course, good old fashioned custom lineage would be a great consideration as well. So we could start off with an 18 strength thanks to a free feat, but to make all of the custom lineage haters out there happy and because I really love elephants, we are gonna go with Loxodon today. They are fantastic for grappling, as we'll get to in a minute. Now, some of you might be wondering why not go Simic Hybrid, since their grappling appendages could particularly come in handy for a grappling build. That's true, but without getting too far into the weeds, I'll just say that I'm not a huge fan of Simic Hybrids for grappling because you have to use your entire action to grapple just a single enemy with them. And later on, when we get extra attack, that would be limited for us and actually we're not often going to be using our action during our turn so it might slow us down anyway loxodons are amazing mechanically at least we're going loxodon for one main reason and that is the trunk loxodons have a trunk and they can use it as a snorkel they can do other simple tasks with it like open a door they can make an unarmed strike with it but above all yes they can grapple someone with their trunk now as a reminder here's how grappling works you take the attack action, but then make a special attack where you attempt to grapple a target within your reach by making an athletics check against your enemy's athletics or acrobatics check, their choice. And if your check is higher, then the target is grappled, which means basically they can't move. They can use their action on their turn to try and break out, repeating the same contest. But in order to grapple someone, you have to have at least one free hand, or in our case, trunk, and also importantly, your enemy can't be more than one size larger than you. Also importantly, once you have them grappled, you can drag them along at half your move speed. So as a Loxodon, you could potentially grapple three enemies, right? If we had both of our hands free, one with each arm and one with your trunk. Or as I'm going to plan on doing personally here, grapple two enemies, one with your arm, one with your trunk, and then leave one hand open to equip a shield, which will be really great for our survivability, as I think this character is going to be getting attacked a lot, and we're not actually going to be able to pull off the damage tactic that I have in mind with more than two enemies anyway, I'll get into that later on, but having the option to grapple a third if we wanted to is going to be really cool. As for the other Loxodon traits, among other things, they do get very nice Loxodon Serenity, which gives advantage on saves against being charmed or frightened, and that's actually quite potent. They have natural armor, which we're not going to be using, but also powerful build, which lets us lift, drag, push, or carry more weight than we otherwise would be able to. Now, some of you also may be thinking that having a race with powerful build would be important for a character who wanted to be grappling and dragging potentially multiple enemies per turn. Since we're told in the player's handbook that we can only drag a certain amount of weight based on our strength, score, our size, etc. And are we going to need to know this and how much weight can we drag? if we're going to be constantly dragging enemies. Maybe your DM might bring up that question for you if you're trying to play this character at their table. Keep in mind that the rules involving dragging grappled enemies don't actually interact with those particular weight capacity dragging rules, as made clear by this tweet from Jeremy Crawford. This public service announcement brought to you by the Grapplers Guild. The mo you know. As for our starting abilities, I'm assuming we're going point by method as always and would recommend starting with a 15 strength and taking our plus two from our racial there, a 15 constitution and our plus one there, and then a 14 charisma. I would love to get that charisma score higher for bardy purposes, but our strength will be our most important stat since the success of our grapple is dependent upon it. And like I said, I have a feeling we're going to be targeted by our enemies quite a bit since I plan to have at least two of them in a headlock most of the time. So for that reason, I want to get our constitution up as high as I can here early as well for survivability purposes, right? It's also gonna help on our concentration checks too. As for our starting equipment, nothing really special here. For now, we're just going to be a regular like sword and board fighter. Take chainmail, take a shield, and your favorite D8 weapon. So yeah, when we first meet our champion, they are a Loxodon in their majesty's service. Maybe having watched the Jungle Book so many times, it's really difficult for me to imagine like a martial elephant in any other way, but, but for sure they have a British accent and are full of bluster. But, but, they also harbor a secret love of music and the spoken word. When no one is watching, 
they probably are pulling out a lute or a harp. Or actually, no, they just trumpet soft and solemn songs through their trunk, dreaming of heroic deeds of yore. Or, better yet, great feats of bravery that they themselves will one day accomplish, with their own name immortalized in bardic verse for future generations to draw inspiration from for millennia to come. But anyway, as a fighter, at level 1 we get second wind, which lets us heal for 1d10 plus our fighter levels as a bonus action, once per short rest, nice little survivability thing, especially early on. And then we get a fighting style. Defense would not be a bad choice for us, giving us a plus 1 to our AC, but since I'm building this character for damage, I'm going to go ahead and take the unarmed fighting style here, which lets our unarmed strikes be a d8 plus our strength modifier, instead of just a 1 plus our strength modifier as usual. And it could actually be a d8 if we decided to drop our shield. Feel free to go that route if you really want to forego a weapon, right? But also with the unarmed fighting style, we can do an extra d4 of damage once per turn to one creature grappled by us. No action or bonus action or anything required for that d4 of damage, we just have to have them grappled. Free kidney shot or nose tweak or something once per round. Not amazing, but I'll take it. At level two, we get action surge, meaning that once per short rest, we can take two actions on our turn instead of one. This is going to be especially handy for us to let us, say, grapple one enemy with the attack action, then action surge and grapple another one on the same turn, so long as we can actually get over to the first and then drag them over to the second, right? Or later on, cast a spell with our action and then run up and grapple one enemy or enemies after we get extra attack with a second action after we action surge. Really lets us get into our rotation a lot quicker and that's awesome. But at level three, fighters get their fighter subclass, their martial archetype, and yes, we're going, as I'm sure many of you have already predicted, with my favorite, the Rune Knight. When it comes to building a grappler, it's really, really hard to beat the Rune Knight. So yes, our Loxodon fighter has apparently been learning some runic magic in their journeys. Or perhaps this is just something that they bring with them from their tribe. I don't think it would be too difficult to like reflavor things here as not necessarily being taught from frost giants and cloud giants, but from the innate magic that the giant-like Loxodons themselves have fostered and harnessed over centuries. This might simply be something that you've inherited from your people as part and parcel of what it means to be a Loxodon from your tribe and your world. But regardless of how you came by it, as a rune knight, we get a couple of really fantastic features. First of all, rune carver list. We carve these runes into something that we wear or a weapon, and they all give some fairly minor passive benefits, but then tell us that once per short rest, we can activate each rune for some fantastic abilities. I think for this build, I would go cloud first up, as I always do, because it's just the best thing in the world, letting you, when you activate it, use your reaction to cause a successful attack from one creature that you can see within 30 feet to just instead target a different creature that you can see within 30 feet. So many amazing shenanigans and life-saving ridiculousness that you can get into with the cloud rune. As for our second rune, I think I probably go with frost on this build. This lets you, with a bonus action, give yourself a plus two bonus to strength and constitution ability checks and saves. That's quite potent for a character who really wants great strength checks and will eventually be concentrating on a spell all the time and needing as much bump to their constitution saving throw and thus concentration checks as possible. But the main reason that we're here, of course, is for the other feature that rune knights get at level three, giant's might. This lets us, proficiency bonus times per day, and with a bonus action, grow to large size, get advantage on strength checks and saves, hence why I said going gif would be a little redundant, and deal an extra 1d6 of damage when we hit with a weapon attack or an unarmed strike, once per turn. So yes, for those who have forgotten, keep in mind that we can only grapple targets one size larger than us, and depending on your table and your campaign, huge creatures, that is, creatures that are one size larger larger than large aren't all that uncommon in D&D 5e. So building a character who's focused on grappling, but who is limited because they're medium size to only being able to grapple creatures that are large size or smaller can potentially really throw off your groove. Beware the groove. <laughs> now, as a rune knight with giant smite, we don't have to worry about it as much because we can grow to large size and thus grapple and drag 
huge creatures or smaller. And that is Wunderbar. And of course, getting advantage on those grapple checks while we're at it is just that much better. Yay, Rune Knights. But at level four, with our all important giant smite feature secured, I think it's probably time for us to leave Fighter behind. You see, that song that our hero has been typically singing to just themselves every night, quietly tooting out through their trunk, it has grown into something more. I think that when we finally unlocked that runic magic of our people, it awoke something within us that caused that seed of song that we were keeping to ourselves to flower into something that now we want to share with the rest of the world, or at the very least, with the rest of our party. You have realized that you have a gift, a talent that is more than just performative, but also magical. And you can use this gift to inspire your allies, bolster them with courage and valor, and strike fear into the hearts of your enemies. Whatever your reasons, yes, we are taking bard levels now. Now, of course, if you wanted to stay with Fighter until Fighter 5, a couple more levels, it wouldn't be the worst thing ever, especially if you were going to be ending this character at around level 7 or 8, that's where your campaign's ending. You know, you'd get another ability score increase or feat at Fighter 4 for better strength score and extra attack at level 5, that would be really nice. Extra attack is going to end up eventually being redundant for us on this character though, and honestly, isn't the most important feature for us. It's definitely nice. It's gonna help us grapple two enemies in a single round potentially, instead of trying to do it over two rounds, but not as important as other things. I really just wanted to start getting into our bardic features as soon as possible, especially those spells among other things. So yeah, for me, I'm taking the departure now. And so as a bard, one, we get bardic inspiration, which means that charisma modifier times per day, and that's kind of a bummer. We can, with our bonus action, give a d6, our bardic inspiration die, to an ally within 60 feet who can hear us. On this character, I totally imagine that looking like you're blowing out this huge trumpeting blast that sounds super noble and empowering, like a big war horn or something, right? Anyway, that ally who you inspire can then use that inspiration die in the next 10 minutes on an attack roll ability check or saving throw of their choice. Super useful and handy, and a really nice option for our bonus action that we can take advantage once we've got our Giant's Might and or Frost Rune going in the middle of combat, right? We also get spells, of course, and at level one, there's not really anything that I'd necessarily be relying heavily on during combat. I'd probably be focusing on utility and support spells, really for the entire character career here, with one exception. And that's because we don't really have a great spell casting ability modifier, right, with a 14 charisma. We're always going to be in this kind of strange place of being a somewhat mediocre charisma bard, which is a little odd and funny and okay. We still love ourselves. But yeah, I'd probably avoid spells that are going to require saving throws from the enemy or require us to make spells attacks. So I would go for things like message here for nice utility, healing word naturally to be able to heal in a pinch and bring our enemies back from unconscious with our bonus action. Feather fall could come in handy and actually silvery barbs would be really great for us because we use it as a reaction when an enemy that we see succeeds on an attack roll, a saving throw, or an ability check, including that grapple check, right? And then we'll give advantage to us or an ally on their next attack roll, ability check or save. Very potent. For our concentration right now, I'd probably be using heroism, I think, which gives one creature, or yourself if you want, immunity to fear, and then two, because it's based on your charisma modifier, temporary hit points at the beginning of each of their turns. Not a huge bump, but not bad, round after round. And yeah, I love, if you don't already know this about me, making characters who have lots of great support options, though they might be built with a focus for damage or control or something else, or in our case, both. But yeah, that's definitely going to be a strength of this character, having some really great support features and functionality in addition to everything else they're doing. At level five, we would be a bard too, and we get jack of all trades. This is such a great feature and is one of the reasons why bards are so great at utility. 
With Jack of All Trades, if you make an ability check that doesn't already include your proficiency bonus, you can add half of your proficiency bonus rounded down. Yes, this ability can apply to our initiative rolls, though that might be changing with one D&D. And for us, that's really nice because we kind of dumped our deck score, right? We also do get Song of Rest here, which tells us that when anyone in our party is spending hit dice to recover hit points during a short rest, we can play a lovely tune or tell a soothing tale and thus grant an additional d6 of healing to whatever they're already recovering from their hit dice. Nice little bump. But level 6, Bard 3, is where everything really comes together for this build. Level 6 is a huge level for us. First up, we get Expertise. Expertise lets us double our proficiency bonus for two skills that we're proficient in. So yes, of course, we want to take Expertise in Athletics first off for a big bump to our grapple checks. And for the second skill that we choose, I'd say pick your favorite. If it were me, I'd probably go with performance because I am a bard after all, but feel free to go with perception or persuasion or stealth or whatever you want. And then we get the all-important second level spells. Now, I would say you should definitely get aid for a really nice buff to maximum HP of three of your party members. Great support spell. Lesser restoration is going to be a nice little way to cure some conditions and poison and things. Invisibility can be really handy for utility, exploration, even trying to get surprise on your enemy. But the two spells that I really want to focus on that are very important for this build are first up, Enlarge Reduce. Right now, with Giant's Might active, we can grapple all but the largest creatures in the game, Gargantuan, that's as big as it gets. With the Enlarge Reduce spell, we could even grapple Gargantuan creatures. We would simply have to use Giant's Might on ourselves first, making us large, and then cast the Enlarge Reduce spell on ourselves, enlarging us to huge meaning that we could then grapple gargantuan creatures if we wanted. Now, the spell requires our concentration, so I would only use it if you were going up against gargantuan creatures and really felt like you really needed to grapple them for whatever reason, because using up our concentration on this spell would mean that we would do way less damage. Having the option to do so is really nice. But what I would otherwise plan on using our concentration for is the other spell we need to make sure we get here, and yes, I'm talking Cloud of Daggers. I seriously love this spell for a number of reasons, though at first glance it might seem a little weak. With Cloud of Daggers, you cast it as an action and then for one minute it fills a five foot cube with spinning daggers so long as you maintain your concentration. A lot of people poo poo this spell because the area of effect is pretty little and you can't move it once you've cast it. But there are some really great things about it. First of all, like the other spells I talked about in the preamble, creatures take damage from this spell once on a turn if they either start their turn in the area of the spell or move into the area on a turn and yes like i said at the beginning forced movement counts here again check the sage advice compendium if you need to also very importantly there is no saving throw given for the damage that enemies take from cloud of daggers if they are in the area they just straight up take the damage doesn't matter what their armor class is doesn't matter what their saving throws are and that's particularly particularly fantastic for a character who, because they're so focused on their strength so they can be a great grappler, doesn't have a particularly high charisma score, right? It's 44 damage that they take plus 2d4 more for every spell level that you upcast it at, and that's some pretty nice scaling to boot. But also at Bard 3, we get our Bard College, our Bard subclass. Man, this is the level that just keeps on giving. And what do you think we're going to take? If you said swords, you guessed wrong. You only think I guessed wrong, that's what's so funny. I switched glasses while your back was turned. <laughs> Stop it with the Princess Bride quotes. No, but you did, because we're going not swords, but that's right, Valor Bard. One of those bardic subclasses that I have yet to use in a build. And for that reason, let's go ahead and read what Wizards of the Coast has to say about them. Bards of the College of Valor are daring scalds whose tales keep alive the memory of the great heroes of the past, and thereby inspire a new generation of heroes. These bards gather in mead halls or around great bonfires to sing the deeds of the mighty, both past and present. They travel the land to witness great events firsthand and to ensure that the memory of those events doesn't pass from the world. With their songs, they inspire others to reach the same heights of accomplishment as the heroes of old. Oh, that is just perfect for how I envision this character. So yes, Valor. 
the oft thought of lesser of the two extra attack bard subclasses. Why Valor, you may ask? Honestly, the main reason is because most of the stuff that swords bards get, we just really wouldn't make use of. Those flourishes for swords bards require weapon attacks, and we're not making weapon attacks, at least not from this point. We're simply holding the faces of our enemies in a whirling cloud of weapons that we have magically created, and that's not technically the same thing. So, Valor Bards at level 3 get weapon and armor proficiencies that we already have, but then also combat inspiration, which is kind of a nice additional way for our allies to use our inspiration. Now, in addition to using it for an attack ability check or saving throw, they can use it to add to the damage of an attack they make, something that I wouldn't typically recommend doing actually unless you're very confident that the enemy you're attacking is going to die with just a teeny bit more damage, or maybe if you get a critical hit so that you could then double the damage from the Bardic Inspiration die. Or, though, they can add the Bardic Inspiration to their armor class as a reaction when they are hit by an attack, sort of like a mini shield spell. So yeah, some nice little additional options for our inspiration that Valor Bards get that others don't. And once in a while, it will be just the right thing for our allies to use, making us that much better at being a decent little support character. All right, at level six, it's time for our first damage report. So let's discuss what I envision combat looking like for our brawling bard here. On round one, you're going to use a bonus action to enable Giant's Might, and then, assuming you've got Action Surge available, cast Cloud of Daggers with your action, and then Action Surge, run up, grapple an enemy, and move them into Cloud of Daggers. They'd take damage then, and on their turn when they started their turn there. On round two, you'd want to use Frost Rune as a bonus action. If you've got it and you're anticipating your enemies having a decent chance at getting out of your grapple, then go grapple a second enemy, drag them into Cloud of Daggers as well. Keep in mind that one nice thing about Cloud of Daggers is that while it does only take up a five foot cube, there's no reason why that five foot cube has to snap to the grid, as Jeremy Crawford likes to say. So you you could cast it between two five foot squares on the grid on the map right and we know that enemies will take damage from an area of effect spell if they are in a space that is at least half covered by the spells area of effect so yes you could hold two creatures in a place where they were each being hit by cloud of daggers this isn't something that i typically do but really quick let me just kind of show you what this might look like on the actual playing field, right? Here's us, we've grown to large size, we've used our giant's might. We could move up, grapple this enemy here, since they are within five feet of us, right? And then move up, drag them, so that they are here. Notice that we've cast Cloud of Daggers. It is a five foot cube, but it's kind of between these two spaces in the middle, right? It doesn't have to snap to the grid and fill one five foot predefined square on the grid, right? That would be turn one, turn two, we grapple this guy, move them here, and now both enemies are in a square that's at least half covered by the Cloud of Daggers area of effect, so they would each take the damage. On our turn, we'd move out, drag them each with us, and then drag them back in, boink boink, so they take damage on our turn, as well as when they start in the area of effect. So yes, once you've got two enemies grappled, and this will be much easier once you've got extra attack. On subsequent rounds, it just goes like this. On your turn, first you do a d4 of damage to one of the enemies that you have grappled, thanks to your unarmed fighting style. Then, like I showed, you move the bad guys out of the cloud of daggers and back in. Now, notice you haven't used your action yet. This is important because we're actually not going to use our action on our turn. We are simply going to take the ready action. You need a reminder on what that means? Got it. When you ready your action, you use your reaction to do something before the start of your next turn. First, you decide what's going to trigger your reaction. For us, it could simply be at the start of Bob's turn or after a six second pause or a 12 second pause, etc. Then simply decide what action you will take once the trigger happens or the player's handbook tells us, move up to your speed in response to that trigger. So yes, this means that once the trigger happens, we can use our move speed to once again drag our enemies out of the area of effect of Cloud of Daggers and push them back in for another healthy heaping of Blendtec. 
Then finally, on the creature's own turn, they will be starting their turn within the area of effect of the spell and thus take damage for a third time in the round. Triple dip. This, of course, is assuming that you are able to grapple them in the first place, that they haven't escaped in the meantime, but if you've got a plus three strength modifier, which is what we have right now, advantage on your athletics checks, thanks to Giant's Might, expertise in athletics, thanks to Bard, and your Frost Rune active, you're gonna have a plus 11 to your grapple checks with advantage, and you're level six. There's a really, really good chance that you're going to succeed and that they are not going to break out. And once you've got them, they're just going to take that damage, regardless of their armor class, regardless of any saving throws. Now, quickly, a note on the math here. It's really hard. <laughs> Harder than I can easily do, at least, because I have to calculate both their role, my role, with advantage, plus any modifiers to those roles, right? I just don't have a great calculator that can do all of that and give me exact likelihood of outcomes. I've done some rudimentary math and I'm very confident that it's very close to actual results, but I also am very confident that I'm off by a little bit. There's a margin of error here. It's not gonna be huge. I don't think it'd be more than two, three DPR, but if anybody knows of a good calculator that can give you grapple success probabilities based on bonuses to check and even advantage, I'd love to see it. Otherwise, you're just gonna have to take my word for it here that against enemies with a plus zero to their athletics or acrobatics checks, we would on average do about 59 damage per round. And that's divided between two enemies, right? And against enemies with a plus five to those checks, it would be 54 DPR. And Comparing that to other multi-target sustained damage builds that I've done to date at this level, check the video description to see those comparisons in the graphs and spreadsheets. This is more damage than any of those. Not to mention, we're putting some serious control down on two, potentially even three targets. Yeah, it takes a while to ramp up, especially since we don't have extra attack and if you don't have action surge available. Also, it might not even work against two enemies if they're spread too far apart from one another, right? Because we can only move at half our move speed when we're dragging. Or you might have burned through all of your giant's might uses for the day. We only have three per long rest right now. Or you could be out of second level spell slots for a cloud of daggers. I get it. Working in a theory crafting lab is different than in an actual combat encounter in the game. Not only that, but if your enemies decide that instead of trying to escape your grapple, they're just going to start wailing on you every single turn, you could be almost guaranteeing two enemies focused on attacking you and only you every single round. That will potentially mean a lot of concentration checks and a lot of damage. Now, fortunately, we have a 20 AC right now, assuming that we've got plate mail, armor, and a shield, and we do have a decent constitution score, proficiency in constitution saves, and a plus two to our constitution and concentration checks if we've got frost rune active. But still, there will be times when you're gonna come out of a fight much worse for wear and you might want to make sure you've got a good healer in your party to back you up. All of that said, the potential for this build is crazy good when you factor in the control and damage capabilities and I love it. At level seven, we will be a bard four, and that means an ability score increase for feet. I think I'm going to want to take the Heavy Armor Master feat here. Like I said before, I think you're probably going to be getting attacked a lot on this character, and even though we've got a good armor class, sometimes we're still going to get hit, and Heavy Armor Master can go a long way to increasing our survivability, letting us reduce incoming bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks, and most enemies in 5e don't make magical attacks, by three per hit. Now, that might not seem like a lot, but it does add up and will help keep our concentration checks lower as well. Maybe best of all for us is that it's a half feed, letting us add one to our strength so that we get a nice even 18 strength score now. We are the strongest bard. At level eight, we would be a bard five and we get third level spells. I would again stick with the theme here of going for support and utility options primarily. So catnap would be great for a nice short rest in 10 minutes instead of an hour, which will actually be super important for us since our runes and our action surge reset on a short rest. Dispel magic will be handy. Tiny hut for greater safety when we're sleeping, among other things. Motivational speech to give us and our allies some nice temporary hit points. 
things like that. Don't forget though that we can now upcast Cloud of Daggers to 6d4 of damage with a third level spell slot, which is what I'll be assuming we're doing with our next damage report. Also, at this level, our Bardic Inspiration die goes up to a d8 from a d6, so slightly more potent Bardic Inspirations. And best of all, we get Font of Inspiration, which means that our Bardic Inspirations reset on a short rest now instead of a long one, giving us a lot more uses of our Bardic Inspiration in a day, and also making Catnap that much better too. At level 9, we would be a Bard 6. And as a Valor Bard, that means we get extra attack. And this is really kind of the main reason I wanted to go Valor Bard for our Bard College, because extra attack, yes, means that we can potentially grapple up to two enemies on the same turn when we take the attack action. Since grapple simply replaces one of our attacks, and there's no reason why we couldn't use the other attack from extra attack to also make a grapple check, so long as we can actually get to the other target, or do it again on the same target if they happened to succeed on their first attempt. Questionably useful ability, it tells us that as an action we can start a performance lasting until our next turn that gives us and our allies advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened, uh, something that we already have as a Loxodon actually. If you could use this as a reaction, it would be way better. The enemy does something that makes you roll a saving throw and as a reaction you give your allies advantage, right? Oftentimes, fear and charm effects don't allow for a saving throw once we're under their influence. And regardless, having to use up our entire action for it is kind of rough. But still, it will come in handy once in a while. All right, at level nine, time for our next damage report. Since last check, we have gained one to our strength score for more reliable grapples, we'll now have a plus 14 to our grapple checks with Frost Rune active, and we can upclass Cloud of Daggers to 64 like I said. We've also added some really nice defensive support and utility capabilities to our Bardic Brawler, and we're feeling really good about ourselves as a result, as are our party members. But against enemies with a plus zero to their athletics or acrobatics check, we would on average here to two enemies do around 90 damage per round. And against enemies with a plus six, it would be around 83 DPR. And again, I know that's a little bit off, but I'm very confident that it's close. And with those numbers, anyway, we continue to be at the top of the pack compared to other sustained multi-target DPR builds at this level, and that is amazing. Go, Buff Bard, go. Um, it started to rain, and I hope that you can hear it, but that it's not distracting, because I love the sound of rain. At level 10, we would be a Bard 7, and that means we get 4th level spells. Nothing that I'm going to plan on using in combat here, but lots of great options, of course, including Dimension Door for a huge teleport that lets you bring a friend, freedom of movement to keep you or an ally from being slow to restrained, greater invisibility for some improved sneaking and even constant advantage if you'd rather use your concentration for that over Cloud of Daggers for some reason. Same with Polymorph, which is just sort of infinitely useful and often hilarious. I'm just gonna say PYF, pick your favorites. At level 11, we would be a Bard 8, and we get another ability score increase, or feat. And yeah, I'm gonna bump strength here, taking it to 20, so it's capped. This improves our grapple checks, which is sort of the most important thing that we're doing for both control and damage on this character. Big beefcake burly bard. At level 12, we would be a Bard 9, and our Song of Rest goes to a D8 instead of a D6, making it give us just a little more healing on our short rest for you and your friends. We'll take it. And then fifth level spells. Fifth level spells are always awesome. Many of them require an enemy save, so I'm just gonna say make sure to grab Greater Restoration for a really nice, like, cure-all spell, and then raise dead, since we didn't actually have access to a resurrection spell before. No revivify for bards, unfortunately. But now we've got one in our pocket to break out in case of emergency, and that's great. At level 13, we would be a bard 10, and our bardic inspiration die now jumps up to a d10 for even better valorous deeds for your allies. We also get another round of expertise here. Um, again, pick your favorites on this one. You know, stealth, persuasion, intimidation seems particularly fitting for this character. But the really great thing about Bard 10, of course, is magical secrets. This lets us pick two spells from any spell list and learn them as though they were Bard spells, so long as they are fifth level spells or lower. What spells should we take? Here are the ones that I would go for. First of all, I think I'm going Wall of Force. It's one of the best control spells in game, and best part about it for us is that it doesn't allow for enemy saving throws. You just 
plop down an invisible wall or a dome around the bad guys and bam, they're trapped. It requires concentration, yes, but sometimes there are just going to be situations where your party will be better off with this than they would be with your cloud of dagger shenanigans. And hey, you can still grapple enemies if you want or make weapon attacks against them, but if you go grapple plus wall of force, that means a boatload of control while the rest of your party just takes out the one or two enemies left that aren't being locked down, right? I think for my second spell here with Magical Secrets, I'm probably taking Find Greater Steed. I mean, it lets you summon a freaking griffin and ride it as a mount. And if you're trying to tell me that you would not absolutely love to see an elephant riding on the back of a half eagle, half lion, then I'm gonna call you a liar. It just adds some really fantastic utility for us, being able to fly and all, and could potentially add some damage to our DPR as well, depending on how the spell is used and ruled at your table. I'm not going to actually include it in damage calculations because we're already making quite a few assumptions for those damage reports, and I just don't really want to muddy the waters. Anyway, let me know what you would take for your magical secrets here if they're different. Inquiring minds want to know. But yes, speaking of damage reports, level 13, time for the next one. Since last check, we have capped our strength score and increased the potential damage that our Cloud of Daggers could do by another 4d4 for a total of 10d4 if we were to use a fifth level spell slot for it. And yeah, we've also continued to just increase our utility and support capabilities, not to mention control. We are a wonder to behold. And against enemies with a plus zero to their athletics or acrobatics checks, we would do on average about 151 DPR to the two enemies together. And against enemies with a plus seven to their checks, it would be around 142. And yeah, par for the course compared to other sustained multi-target builds at this level, we're, we're beating all of them and the gap just keeps getting bigger. And the primary reason for that is both A, how well Cloud of Daggers scales, and B, how it just doesn't care about armor class or enemy saving throws. It does care about their acrobatics or athletics checks, but we have such a huge advantage on ours compared to the vast majority of creatures you're going to be running into that the damage is just kind of phenomenal. At level 14, we would be a bard 11, and this means 6th level spells. As always, many great ones, but arguably the best 6th level spell of them all, Mass Suggestion, which is so strong in that it can just remove so many enemies out of a fight and doesn't even require concentration. But unfortunately, it also allows enemies to have a saving throw to not be affected by it, right? That said, it is a wisdom save that the enemies are making, and a lot of enemies in 5e don't have a great bonus to their wisdom save. It also can affect multiple enemies. So even if you only manage to get like a third of the enemies to fail the save and then run home to their families in order to save them from impending doom or whatever suggestion you place in their mind, it might still be worth taking. Other ones to consider though that just work regardless, find the path could be really great for utility if you're lost or unsure where to go, or of course Hero's Feast, which is an amazing buff giving your entire party immunity to poison and fear as well as advantage on wisdom saves and big boosts to maximum hit points for 24 hours. Anyway, pick your favorite. At level 15, we would be a bard 12, and that means another ability score increase or feat. I'm a little bit torn here. I mean, resilient wisdom would be smart, getting you proficiency on your very important wisdom saves. Increasing your constitution score would be nice, both for more hit points and slightly better constitution saves and concentration checks, or even Warcaster for that matter, to give us advantage on our concentration checks. I think for me, if I were playing this character in game, I'd probably go Charisma here. I just hate being a bard and only being able to give inspiration two times per short rest. Three times per short rest just feels way better. Plus, it does make me a teeny bit more confident in using things like Mass Suggestion. If I took that spell or others that might require a save, it gives a teeny bump to my heels, things like that. I wouldn't blame you for going a different route. I'm going Charisma. At level 16, we would be a Bard 13, and that means 7th level spells. Resurrection could be a nice option for an even more powerful version of Raise Dead. With Resurrection, you can bring the dead back as long as they've been dead for a mere 100 years or less, as opposed to Raise Dead's 10 days or less. Regenerate is a really great support spell. 
it does a little bit of healing now on one ally, but then also one more hit point every single turn on their turn. Meaning, yes, they're almost death and unconscious proof for at least one entire combat encounter anyway, barring massive killing blow damage from an enemy, right? Teleport's great for hopping all over the world, but I think I think the one I'm probably taking is Force Cage. Force Cage is like an improved wall of force. It doesn't require concentration, and enemies have to make a charisma save in order to even attempt to teleport out of it, unlike wall of force. And you know, another great reason to bump charisma last level if we're going this route. So yeah, now we don't have to sacrifice our damage for that extra uber control, and I love having my cake and eating it too. I like cake. Song of Rest also gets another little bump here to D10, feels a little bit like a non-feature. I, I don't know why they didn't just let Song of Rest scale with Bardic Inspiration, and I suppose I never will know. But finally, for us, at level 17 we would be a Bard 14, and I'm pretty happy to have reached Bard 14 because it means we get the Valor Bard capstone. Unfortunately for us, it's probably useless. <laughs> It's called Battle Magic, and tells us that if we use our action to cast a spell, we can make a weapon attack as a bonus action. Wah, wah. Now, here's hoping that you can convince your DM to let this mean for you that you can make an attack as a bonus action, and not specifically just a weapon attack, so that you could grapple as a bonus action when you cast a spell. And that would be really nice. If you can't convince them to do this, I just might take Fighter 4 at this level to get another ability score increase and bump our charisma once more. But then again, maybe I wouldn't do that because at Bard 14 we get another round of Magical Secrets. And this time the spells that we're stealing from other classes can be level 7 or lower. Hmm, I'm thinking probably Contingency and like Heal? Maybe Reverse Gravity? Simulacrum, if you have lots of time and money and snow for some reason. <laughs> so weird. Anyway, go ahead and pick your favorites here for Magical Secrets. We all know you're just going to use that 7th level spell slot to upcast Cloud of Daggers anyway, because you're such a slave to that spreadsheet. Alright, maybe that's just me, because yes, at level 17, time for our final damage report, and we could potentially upcast Cloud of Daggers to do all of 14d4 of damage now, which is kind of awesome, assuming that we've got two targets that we're holding there and dipping into back and forth three times in a round. Beyond that, since last check, we've just continued to add really fantastic tools to all of our utility, support, and control options. But against enemies with a plus zero to their acrobatics and athletics checks, we would do on average around 212 DPR. And against enemies with a plus eight to those checks, it would be around 201 damage per round. And yeah, we just continue to be head and shoulders above the other sustained multi-target damage builds if we compare ourselves to them at this level. So, let's get into final thoughts. The tier score, if you take all of the damage that we were doing against two targets at ability checks from zero to plus 15, at each of the damage reports that we reported on and just average those all together to get one number, we come up with a 117. And here's what's kind of funny. Before I started writing the script for this build, but I kind of had everything outlined, I hadn't crunched the numbers yet, I was really prepared to get to this point of the episode and be kind of apologetic. Like, okay, okay, fine, the numbers aren't that fantastic. But hey, keep in mind how much control we're bringing to the table here, not to mention all of the utility and support that we bring. Locking down two, potentially three targets, if we forego our shield. So yeah, think of this character like the Battlesmith Controller, that light hammer thrower character, right? Or like the Shieldmaster build, where they did okay damage, but were also a really great controller to boot. But after having gone through it all now, I'm kind of like, dang. I mean, I've never had a character that could average over 200 DPR sustainably before, whether single target or multi-target. And then, yeah, you add the control and the support and the utility that this character brings with them. I think you could make the argument that this might be the most powerful character I've ever built to date. Now. There are some considerations, some asterisks, some caveats, of course. Some of them I've already mentioned. You won't always have all of your resources available. It might take some ramp up time. You might not 
be able to even get to two enemies on the battlefield, grapple them both, and pull them back into the very small area of effect for Cloud of Daggers. Maybe we consider a spell with a bigger area of effect in that case, like a wall of fire or something. One big caveat that I haven't really mentioned yet, but feel like I should, is this. It's pretty cheesy, right? <laughs> I mean, I see people groan in the comments when I talk about just doubling up on Cloud of Daggers or Spirit Guardians or Moonbeam already. Regardless of the fact that Wizards of the Coast has expressly given the tactic their blessing in the Sage Advice Compendium. That said, your DM may very well just throw up their hands and say, okay, you know what? No. You can't ready your action to triple dip. I don't care what the rules say, it feels cheesy and wonky and I'm just not gonna allow it. Obviously, to try and prevent that from happening, I would for sure talk with my DM about my plan with this character before I even try bringing them to the table, something that we should always do, but especially if you have any kind of concern that they might be like, mm, they might say no, or they might say yes. They might also say yes, and then four or five sessions in, just decide to give all of their enemies huge bonuses to their acrobatics or athletics checks. Or like, all of a sudden, everybody has Misty Step. How weird. But if it ends up working like I think it should, even only some of the time and it might take two or three rounds to get there, this character would be muy poderoso, very powerful, and I think so much fun. A strength-based bard, a valor bard who's not even making weapon attacks, a loxodon who's holding multiple enemies into a meat grinder while trumpeting valiant ballads to inspire their allies? I know you want to play this character. I know I certainly do. But that is the build for the week, so I hope you enjoyed it. Man, I had a blast with this one. I love you guys. Thank you so much for all that you do for the channel, for me. I hope you'll check out the other content in the channel if you're not currently in the habit of doing so, but more than that, I hope you have a really great day, and I hope you have a fantastic week. And I hope that you're good, and that you're kind, and that you stay safe, and that I see you again really soon. But until then, take care. Bye. And she only reveals what she wants you to see She hides like a child, but she's always a woman to me Are we focused? I worry that we're not focused I think we're focused, but sometimes it looks a little blurry Blurry, blurry Okay, that's good but she can do as she pleases, she's nobody's fool. And she can't be convicted, she's earned her degree. And the most she will do is throw shadows at you. But she's always a woman to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <sighs> oh, Billy Joel. The first musician whose music I really fell in love with when I was real little. Seems like an appropriate song to have on the episode that I bring my wife in for the sponsorship plug. <laughs> Why does my eye squeak when I rub it? <laughs> no, no, no. I skipped that part. Um, don't say that. Well, don't even say right on top of the enemy. Um, no, 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 no. That way. Okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna position you. Okay. Oh, I, I'm like, but the mic's in the way, but it's your camera. It's not, yeah. So it's not. Oh, I'm too tall. Huh. Do you want to switch seats? <laughs> um, sure. It's make me taller. By three, by three, by three per hit. Did you guys notice the candles? I had to light a couple of them. They smell so good. Also, Bard seriously smells like Fruit Loops, exactly like Fruit Loops. And that is so perfect for the way that most of us play our Bard characters. <laughs> Ooh, it started to rain and thunder. Is that okay? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Some of this is going in the outtakes, by the way. <laughs> you don't like the outtakes? <laughs>